Introducing Advantech X-Factor, a new premium subflooring with a built-in barrier for job site durability with Advantech brand's signature strength and stiffness. So whatever the expectation, go beyond with Advantech X-Factor. I'm Jake Bruden, and welcome to the Ooh, Unbuild It podcast. Steve, it Steve was me. delaying starting. You he was thinking you could see a little hamster in his head there running. I was coming uh, up with the perfect intro. And we'll never know what it was. I'm not and even sure today's now. topic is actually one that Steve put forward. That's why we were pestering him into being the one hosting the podcast. Uh, it's listening versus hearing. Yeah. And that is, the, that is the title that Steve put forward. That is the idea that he put forward. And um, I, well, the, the interesting part of it is, I'll rescue you. Um, <laughs> the 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 uh, the interesting part of listening versus hearing, you would think like, okay, I just really need clients that can listen. No, I've I've gotten jobs from clients that worked with other architects that they said weren't good listeners. They never listened to what I had to say, mm -hmm. and um, I can certainly as an architect have a bunch of stories where yeah that builder doesn't really listen he he says yeah he hears me talking but then he just goes about and does what he wants to do um and i actually have a project like that right now where i've had to kind of tell the builder say let's slow it down a little and let's pay attention and let's have a conversation where you're actually an integral part of the conversation not just hearing me talk and then you walk away and it's business as usual. Um, but, you know, so architects, clients, builders, and I would think in your world, Pete, that there's people that certainly want to hear certain things. Like when you go into an investigation, they might not want to hear the bad story. They, you might have clients that are ultra listeners this time around, right? Because they maybe didn't listen as well when they should have been listening. Um, but, you know, we, we can start with clients because that's an easy one to beat up on. I can go all day. Um, I know we were talking about what can we talk about, but I mean, the, the simplest one from a builder architect point of view is the client that never hears budget information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So you could sit there and on the first meeting, I can say, okay, in our market, for what you're asking for, you're somewhere between three and four hundred k to start, or three and four hundred dollars a square foot to start. Not that I like using the square foot number, but mm -hmm. that's our conversation, anyways. And then, you know, you're in meeting four, and they're saying, "Okay, so we're at three thousand feet times two fifty a square." I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, 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 where, where's the two fifty come from?" Well, that's well, what you know. Friend I, of ours I'm, said, "Yeah, a friend of ours, or a builder that we met with a few months ago." I said, "Okay, but remember that first meeting I had where we talked three to four hundred dollars a square foot was probably a more realistic number." Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, you did mention that, didn't you? Okay, so let's, uh, you know, do that. Or you get the budget, and you know, it's a three thousand square foot house, and the price comes in at nine oh five, and they're like, "How did we get there?" Uh, what do you mean? How did we get there? The three hundred dollars a square foot, three thousand square foot, nine hundred k. We're at nine oh five. I consider that we're there. Oh, where, where are you getting this three hundred number? You know, these these are conversations, valid conversations that we have regularly. Yeah, and I'm I'm sure Jake or you have your stories. I have one where I'm going to tell you about a builder, um, and kind of beat up on him a little bit, but. Let's share the table. Well, let's and let's bash clients. So let's continue to bash clients for a second. This is not one specific client. This is seventy-five percent of all of the clients that you and I have worked with together. It's okay. Yeah, we can keep it under that square footage mark as a good ballpark starting point for where our budget needs to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I love the design. We're really close to being done. Uh, do you think we could add another bedroom and another bay to the garage and something else and it still be in budget? No. Well, but we really feel like we need another bedroom <laughs> and another bay in the then garage. You really need then to up the budget. You really need to include <laughs> what you want in the budget then. And it's never 
It's never the case. It's always, but we want yeah. more. They hear you, you talking, can't, but they don't choose to listen. You can't blame them for wanting to squeeze as much in for the budget as possible. Like, I understand how we get well, to I a point where they're... I think that's just human nature. Yeah. I mean, we go and we go buy a car. I don't think I've ever bought a car with drove off the lot with the car that I walked on the lot thinking I was going to buy for the price I was going to buy it. That's yeah, that's a good analogy. Right? So we're we're always spending more money but we're getting a little bit more car and we we we'd like to think we got educated somehow to be able to spend that more money but yeah, it's uh and so you took that in the exact direction I was going to say. So how do we get clients to hear rather than listen? Is it by education? Is um, it by repetition? I like, think we hit them with, I mean, I'll, so I'll tell you what I do. I hit them with what they know, I think. So you walk into somebody's house and they have their Volvo or Range Rover sitting in the driveway. Well, you can walk in the house pretty much um, knowing that, yeah, these people understand value. Or at least, even if they're fault, they're lying to themselves, they believe they understand value. So one of those two conditions exists, because if not, it would have been a go-kart in the uh, driveway, not the Range Rover or, yep. or, or whatever. Whatever the car is. It doesn't have to be Range Rover. Used 1980s um, K car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have driven one of those before. This is uh, not going anywhere that I thought but it was, just, this but, conversation. But so you go in and you explain to people the value in something, like a rain screen. There's a value in rain screen. There's a value in... Hey, you don't have to get your house painted every six or seven years. You can maybe extend that paint life to nearly 20, right? If you do that, now all of a sudden the husband's eyes light up. Okay, for some additional cost, I can play more golf, right? Yep. There's there's a value there in making the house more, less of a liability means that he gets a better lifestyle out of the deal. Um, and... I can't tell you how many projects I've done where people had no idea that triple glazed windows, what they are, why would I do them, et cetera. And they, after being educated, they're spending more money or they just, they're not necessarily um, paying attention. Like I, I've been at the table where the builder walks in and said, you know, yeah, your 900 K budget, we're at one, one and homeowners, you know, they, they, after they get back in their seat, they're like, okay, well, how did we get there? And with a very, um, you know, good explanation from the builder, they sign on and say, well, if that's what it takes for us to build this house, then that's what it takes, yeah. right? I just didn't understand the value or didn't think that was going to cost that much or, or whatever. Or we go back to the drawing board and we at least have an understanding now where the builder can be the one hearing. Yeah. And, or the architect can be the one hearing. And I've, I've tried, like, to remind clients, but even then they don't listen. Like I, I've ended so many meetings and said, you know, hey, Mary, just so you understand, nothing we talked about today contributed to the benefit of the budget. Everything is hurting the budget right now that you talked about today. Well, I know, but let's, their favorite line. Oh, I know, let's but see let's what it see costs. where it comes in. Let's see where the number, I'll yeah. tell you where the number is going to come in. <laughs> Higher than it was before we had this conversation. <laughs> yes, exactly. So you, you need to listen and understand, but we have this ultimate optimism that somehow I can add, 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 and the number doesn't well, change. And I think that builders get caught in that same optimism too. They go, oh man, if I, if they do this and this and this, this house is going to be really cool. My pictures will be better. The neighbors will like that house too. Yeah, we can probably figure out how to do that for that budget. And then they run the numbers and they go, damn, there's no way I can build that house for that. They get optimistic for the same reason. It's it's a challenge. And, you know, the the, the story I have about the builder is, you know, we, we met with a client. It was a design-build relationship. And the client's, you know, okay, we want to build this house for or whatever. Let's just say 800. I forget what the number was. But custom house, 800K. And the builder's like, yeah, I think that's reasonable. So he goes away, um, and we work up some plans and stuff, and we sit in meetings, and then we're, you know, fifth meeting or something, we're, okay, let's talk about the preliminary budget. And he's at, like, 1-1. One, one. And the, the husband's like, we're talking, like, 800K, and we're 300K over that. 
He goes, well, I added in some things there because I just thought these would be nicer and stuff. And he's like, yeah, but I told you 800K was my number. And I'm sitting there just thinking to myself, like, what are we doing here? Because it's not a project at 1-1. Right. It doesn't it, happen. Right. It doesn't happen. If the builder says, well, this is all I can do, then the homeowner's going to say, well, I ain't building the house because he doesn't have one one. So we we go away and the builder's like, OK, I, I'll, I'll take these things out. So he comes back and it's at like nine fifty. <laughs> and it's like, what didn't you understand when we were at the last meeting or the meeting before that? Like. Don't come back until the number is at the eight hundred mark. If you if we have to cut something out, then say, well, we you know we can save you know forty k if we take the third bay off the garage. We can save sixty k if we take the screen and porch off the back. Right, that's what we need to hear. What does it take yeah. to get to this? The is where we are. This mark? is what it takes. Um, so I, I love. I absolutely love pointing at the architect and going, "I'm not the one that set the budget." It's in the drawings, so therefore it's in the budget. If you don't want it in the drawings, or if you don't want it in the budget, it needs to not be in the drawings. I always point at the architect and go, this is not my fault. I'm not the one who decided what the house was. Okay, pilot. Um, you want me to get you a little dish pan here so you can wash your hands? <laughs> so I thought this was going to be about... Did you expect a Bible reference from him today, by the way? That was a biblical reference? Oh, punch his pilot, wash born, your hands. He was born in a parsonage. <laughs> he he should know. Piloted. So I thought this was going to be about old people and the difference between hearing and listening. Hearing and listening. Because hearing what? is a what? physical process. Listening is a mental process. So while we've been sitting here, I've been focusing on listening, not hearing you, but planning my next answer. Because that's that's generally what happens. People cue off of what other people are saying and start to plan what they're going to say. And that means that you're hearing them, but you're not listening. Listening is a full-time job. That's where I thought this was going to be about. It's an but active process. It's an active process and you must be fully engaged in listening. You can't be hearing and making up your next statement. That's, that's not really listening. But, but what I was going to say is that this is a real challenge for me in building investigations because I want to jump right into doing, and you can't start learning about the building until you've listened to the building owner. They have a whole bunch of information. They and they'll that you're say you're not going to get, and they'll say, "I don't want to talk to you about you know I, I I want you to start your work, and that's what I want to do too." But what they don't realize is my work starts with. You who have spent a whole lot of time with this building, it, we can save a lot of time and money sometimes if I just listen. Yeah. But they don't want to pay me to listen. They want to pay me to do. Yeah. So they want me to pull out my equipment. They want me to start evaluating the building. So, But a lot of times if I have a conversation with them four hours into my investigation, it's like, wait a minute, you didn't tell me. I, I work on a project um, where they incidentally mentioned that they have radiant floor heat and it was a problem that might've been in the slab and it's, whoa, wait a minute. That was a real critical piece of information. If we had started with them talking and me listening, it, we might've had a very different approach to the process. So it's funny because my work is pretty different than you guys. I was thinking about it from a totally different, not about clients not listening. It was about me not listening. Yeah. I, I think sometimes I I have to force myself to maybe hear more and listen less. So because I've been accused at like some meetings where we'll walk around and I'll just let the homeowners talk about what we want to do for remodeling our new house. And the wife will turn around and be like, well, do you have, do you any, have any questions? And I'm like, no, I'm just taking it in because not i'm yet. trying to not be like yet. you yeah. like mm -hmm. oh i have tons of opinions just nothing i'm going to share with you right now yeah. because i'm in the extraction process yeah yeah that's very interesting and i need to get as much out of you as i possibly can and then i'll i'll come at you i, I have some opinions i'm certainly not short on them but you're just not going to hear them today because today isn't the right time for that today's the right time for listening so here's the other part of this that i thought um, we were going to go to, which is 
and Stephen, you're going to, you're both as speakers are going to appreciate this. You get done a four hour training, you're pretty drained. And somebody comes up and says, oh, I have this assembly. And they start to oh. talk through all the layers of their building. Okay. First of all, I'm exhausted. You know, I'm, I'm trying to listen and process, but I can't keep up. But the other thing is there are a lot of people that are visual, not auditory. So if you talk to try to talk to me in thin air about a three-dimensional assembly, first thing I want to do is how Can about we if draw we it? draw it? Because yep. there there are times when words fail when drawings and there are other there are people that don't process things auditorially. They need to see it. So your work is really interesting because as an architect, you have to be both very visual and very auditory. You, your client relationship with the client is where it's got to be auditory, but your work is in visual. Certainly. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, and, and, and yours too, you work off the plans that he, that is a, that's a rocket ship pet peeve of mine. You give a, a half day lecture and then somebody comes up and says like, Hey, so I have this building assembly. It's like, well, did you pay attention in slides seven through 12? Because <laughs> your answer let's, was there. Let's be honest. In Steve's presentation, did you pay attention to slides seven through 735? <laughs> what does that mean? Your, your presentations your tend decks. to have more slides in them than anybody you, I know. My, my sole job when we present together is like, whoa, Steve, get that slide content down. An overachiever. Think of it that way. Overachiever. Don't make an offended face. Yeah, let's bash Steve today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening, oh, Steve. No, I'm, I'm gonna, here for I'm you, and I'm the victim mode. lifestyle. I'm <laughs> the victim lifestyle is his favorite lifestyle. I'm hitching. I'm, I'm switching to hearing mode. But but it's it it is it's interesting that if you said listening, like you need to be a good listener, some people would say, well, clients need to be, but they don't really think that they need to be. As builders, you need to be good listeners, mm -hmm. and you need to pay attention to what's important. And, and I think it's even simple things like, um, what's an example? Okay, so I'm working with one builder, and the wife talks about how her, important her dog is, and like he has to get fed and stuff. And the builder says, yeah, no problem. We'll make sure he has water, and just like if you leave the food out, I'll put some food in his bowl at 4 o'clock or whatever, and, you know, and make sure he has it. And But... It's the difference between like hearing her and listening to her because mm -hmm. listening to her, you're capturing her, her, her true needs on the project. Now, granted, she wants a really nice house and the dog isn't, you know, but I can't tell you afterwards, like when she talked about that builder, oh my God, he, he's the greatest builder. Like he fed our dog when, you know, <laughs> during the day and he took him out and, and did these things. But it's because that builder sat there and said, okay, I'm a team player here. Yeah. And what do I have to do to be the ultimate team player for you? Let me listen to you. What are your needs? And I think some builders would sit there and say, you know, roll their eyes and say, lady, if you think I'm feeding your dog or letting them out, you you better get a dog sitter, you know, 1-800-ROVER or whatever and figure this out. But that's the difference between, you know, being in it and not really being in it. Yeah. I think that <clears throat> that listening and hearing process, I think you guys are actually using the analogies differently. Like, his, we are. Yeah. his yeah. listening is your hearing, but the, the listeners are getting the point that it's the pay attention and take it in. Our, uh, our intake process for clients, our interview process, I have a list of 20 or so questions that I ask every client. And I was just sitting here thinking about it, thinking like, I ask, uh, how long have you lived in your current house? Because if you're going to bitch at me about something that's happening in your current house, that I need to take into account at your next house, but you've only lived at your current house for three months, chances are you might not know what mm. really actually upsets you about that house. But if you've been there for 10 years and you've remodeled it, chances are I can take whatever opinion you give me about your current house to heart and understand that we're not gonna have problems. Uh, I ask for goals for the project. Like, what are your goals? What are her goals? What are, what are the goals for your kids for this house, those sorts of things. 
I ask if they've talked to another builder hmm. and then go, okay, how come you're not working with him or with hmm. that? With, how come you're not working with that builder? Cause that answer is super important. It might just be, oh yeah, we do the same thing. That's how we invoice too. So we're not for you either. Uh, and then we also ask what, what, what's success for the project look like for clients? Because even though they might say, uh, you know, we want a really pretty Western view and that doesn't really affect how I go about it. Obviously I have to make sure that the architect includes Western views in the design, but that doesn't guide the whole rest of the project right. potentially. I have to hear what's important to them to be able to measure whether or not we're going to be successful too, because we all, the architect, the builder, the client, we all have our own goal of success, but we have to lace all three of our goals together as well. The, the other thing about this listening and hearing process is that most people don't understand enough about the building process to tell you exactly what they want unless you prompt them and guide them. So part of the listening process is guidance from the building professional about how to think about their project. Like you just mentioned goals and what's success. And those are things that people have a hard time um, applying to a building, I think. Yeah. Every time I ask, have you thought about how you're going to measure not what whether or not this project was successful? Every person goes, oh, and they sit back. Hmm. And they go, well, and I always stop right there and go, uh, listen, I don't have to have an answer right now. Mm -hmm. I do have to have an answer before we build you a house, though. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I sitting here thinking about it. There's also another aspect of, and, you know, you you don't have the uh, the luxury of this one like Jake and I do because you work for yourself. But that inner company kind of relationship and listening and hearing of the older person that might know a little bit more versus the younger person that just came on. Um, you know, first Is this going to be you complaining about your kids working for you? Um, I never complain about I love okay. my kids dearly. I don't complain about them. Um, not on tape at least, but, uh, <laughs> it's not a safe space for him. <laughs> but, but having, having, having them, you know, come on board but i'm just saying if if you look at like the older 55 year old builder that just hired some new you know 20 year old carpenter the 20 year old carpenter he might have a valid hey you know if i did this this way i could probably be faster than when the way we did over at the joneses but the that 55 year old can he, hear him right or you know, take it in and say, okay, let's hear what you have to say and let's see and, and test that theory out. Or he can just sit there and be the old curmudgeon and just say, you know, Tommy, just shut up. Just do what I tell you to do. And, I heard you, but I'm not really listening. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. you know, he turns his back and walks away. And so how do you ever evolve? And, and it's not even how do you evolve as a better company? It's how do you establish a good working relationship with the younger people in the company, if you don't give them the respect to at least stop and listen to them, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I'll, I'll tell you, probably, I would say he's probably the most successful client I've ever had. And I was doing a project for him. It wasn't his private house. It was actually a residual property from some stuff that he did. And, uh, the, the thing that I learned very quickly about him, and, and part of this probably even just stems from having worked with him, was how damn good of a listener this guy was. Hmm. Like, if if I was about to say something, and, and I have a one or two clients now, and what's interesting is there's a de very definitive pattern that if I start talking, they shut up. They don't interrupt. They sit there, they listen intently. When I'm done, then they respond. But they listen. Mm -hmm. The clients that I have the biggest problem with they freaking talk over me they interrupt they tell me what i'm gonna do they tell me how it is and it's like yeah. i might not be the smartest person in building science i'm not saying that but maybe in 30 years i've gained a little bit of knowledge and we're here to do your house and because you read that article last night that doesn't necessarily make you an expert <laughs> tell us how you really feel <laughs> Right? No, I, I'm hearing you. But, uh, <laughs> but, but this, 
but the the interesting thing about this 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 one guy, he he had brought something up and I challenged it. And I don't and and this is a guy whose life for the last 20 years like would say I need that chart and it would appear in a half hour. Mm-hmm. Right? Fully done instant everything. gratification. Instant. That's yeah. the the arena this guy operated in. And so to get challenged, he's like, really? But the thing is, is he stopped. He listened to what I had to say. He agreed with me at the end of the conversation. But the most interesting part of that was everything that came up later in the project. It's, well, I think we should do this, but we should just run that by Steve to make sure we get his opinion. So Hmm. it's you, you gain that respect because for one, I challenged him, but, but two, we sat there and he took the time to listen and understand that there was somebody on the team that was obviously a, a valid contributor that I probably need to listen to more and, and run things by. So, you know, just establishing the relationships, it doesn't really matter. Builder, client, builder, architect, builder to younger builder, architect to younger architect. All these relationships are really, you know, built on being a, what I would consider a good listener. Steve, it just occurred to me that when you and I were starting on the second round of home building crossroads content, and I would tell that story about my dad and how, you know, he, he and I were going at it when I was a teenager and he turned to me because I just wasn't listening. And he said, uh, uh, you have to learn that when someone makes you angry, you're going to w- w- tend to listen less. And if you think about it, they're making you angry because you need to listen more. And it is really hard to listen when somebody is pissing you off and challenging things you hold dear. But generally when that happens, when you feel challenged by something that somebody's saying, you really need to be careful about letting the anger take over because you're probably upset because they're challenging something that is an underpinning of your understanding and it's it's scaring you. Yeah. What I what I tell Lexi is I I, I as parental advice is the person that's usually shouting the loudest about something probably knows the least <laughs> about it. Yeah. Because they have to shout out to make up for not really understanding what they could potentially talk about. Yeah. If they're really secure about their understanding, they will be good listeners and weigh in calmly. But when they're trying to shout you down, that's not a very good sign. I agree. (laughs) Peter, that was a very good point, Peter. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) Yes, it's like a lotus flower. (laughs) Well, you are a flower child. Uh, Weren't you the guy that unlocked the gates at Woodstock? Can I tell you a a story about a flower? You do have a janitor at a farm. (laughs) <laughs> look to you. <laughs> look about you. <laughs> Grounds, at groundskeeper farm. at the at the Woodstock family farm. I have farm. to tell you this very quick story about a flower. <laughs> I was going to school in New York City. My brother Luther was fourteen. He came with his friend Frank Trezinka from Maryland to visit me in New York City. Oh, Frank! Is Frank yeah. going to want to be associated with this? How's yeah. Frank doing? Okay, I haven't seen him is in, he in up years. Easy? Anyway, no. Luther is very gullible, or was at that age, and. I told him, I said, Luther, as soon as we get off the ferry in downtown uh, New York City, people are going to barrage you. They're going to see you as a mark. So don't do anything or give anybody any money until you've checked with me. We get off the ferry and it's there's a lot of people. I turn around and there's a Hare Krishna talking to him and Luther already has his wallet out. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I just got done telling him. So Luther paid like, I think, five dollars for this flower. And I was so angry because we hadn't even been in New York City about 10 minutes. But he'll have 100 years of happiness. Well, that's what we were trying to create. So what I said to him is this. I said, okay, we have to make this flower worth five bucks. How are we going to do that? And what we decided, Frank and Luther and I, um, was that if the three of us could agree on the most beautiful woman we see in New York City, I would walk up to her and give her the flower. We had so much fun because the flower is starting to wilt, right? So we got to do this pretty quickly. Anyway, we finally found a woman on the other side of the street. We all agreed that she was the most beautiful woman we've seen. I ran up in front of her and started to walk backwards. 
And I said, you need to take this flower. My two, my brother and his friend there, this is the first time in New York City. And I'm talking real fast. And she's looking at me and she's like, go on, get out of here. You know, and I'm, I'm like backpedaling. And I finally got her to stop. And I said, if you please just take this flower, because all three of us think we're the, you're the most beautiful woman you see in New York City. We're done. We'll be gone. And she said, if I take that flower, you'll will stop. Will you go away? Will you go yeah. away? <laughs> so I gave her the flower. I, I walked back with Frank and Luther. Please tell me you have a flower today that I can have. <laughs> she turns around and she looks at the three of us and she breaks out in this real big smile and walks away. That's my story of making a flower See, the, worth the, five the, bucks. So the problem I have with that story. <laughs> That's clearly made up. No, no, okay. it's not. No, it's a true it's story. Not, it, it can be a true story, but my question is, how do you know when to stop the search? Oh, when the three of us agreed. Yeah, but, yeah, but how, how do, do you know? How do, how do the three of you know mm. that that woman is the prettiest woman in New York, not the one that's about to come around well, the corner? Well, if if we agree, you got to stop. We agreed so timing. far. We we agree that if okay. if so, then you could have given the flower away to the very the first woman you saw. Could have, yeah, absolutely. Because but she would have been at that she's point one of the one, most so she is the most attractive woman that you saw. It, we all just had to agree that she was the most beautiful. You guys woman in your weird so far. flower pervert logic doesn't doesn't jive with me. Wow, it's funny. I've told this story a lot of Nobody's times. I've never had this reception yet. before. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it's time to wrap. Nobody up. else was taking well, that much you fun. Really and listened. To you, the yeah, you did. You I didn't it. hear. I heard it. You heard. It. <laughs> you heard it. Good good segue, Steve. Well, there you have it. Listening versus hearing. You've heard both approaches. Obviously, Peter and I are coming at it from different angles, but we're arriving at the same place. Common ground. So, and Jake offered something, I think, somewhere in here. I want to go back and watch on YouTube, but I think there was uh, some assistance. He actually did a military bash today, so that's a plus. Um, anyways, smash on that subscribe button. Um, follow along. Make sure you uh, do. You subscribe when you're on like iTunes and stuff. Yes, you do. You do we need them to hear our podcast or listen to our podcast? You could try it either way. <laughs> try it either way. There you go. So Figure out what works for you. You heard from the man. Just get on there, hit that button. Until next time, I'm Steve Basic. Thanks for listening. Listen. <laughs>